Hail and well met, Fulcrum Knights. It is I, your boy Gilbert, here with part two of my audiobook series, Star Wars Republic Commando Hard Contact by Karen Travis. And I bet all of you thought it was going to take me six months to do this. Shame on you. But let's go ahead and get into the comments. First off, we got Iron Warrior saying, Fun fact about Republic Commandos, multiple squads of Commandos disobeyed Order 66 in Legends due to their increased independence. One of those squads even faced the wrath of Vader. Ooh. I'll have to find out what book that's in. Put that in the comments if you if you know. Next we got Chris Wisdom in here saying, Oh yeah, Merry Criffing Christmas to us, Kandosi. Wait, well, Merry Criffing Christmas to you as well. Also, watch your language. I don't care if I, if no one speaks Mandoa, I do. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but fun fact though, Kandosi is actually, I believe it means like indomitable or like uh, fierce. Or, like, more literally or colloquially, it means awesome. So, hell yeah. I love that. Well, excellent use of Mandoa. We also got that invisible guy in here saying, For all the Star Wars books that I've read slash owned, this is the best series they ever did. None of the principal characters were used, and yet one of the best stories told. Loved your first reading, man. Great work. Cheers out there, and blaze on. Hell yeah. I absolutely plan to blaze on, so thank you very much. I also want to shout out Not Ice Husky, saying congrats for 10k well you know what congrats to to us but also like i, I want to say a deep thank you to all of you guys because it wouldn't be that way we wouldn't be where we are without all of you so thank you very much and finally i'm going to end with mike pochins or pochins pochins I, i'm sorry I, I probably butchered your name but mike who says triple zero is gonna go hard well, we will see if it does go hard, because hopefully this audiobook series does well and you guys enjoy it, so then that will determine whether or not I do the next uh, one. I think there's two more books in the series, but we will see. All right, guys, and with that, we are ready for part two of Star Wars Republic Commando Hard Contact. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed reading it. Chapter four. This is the true art of genetic selection and manipulation. A human is naturally a learning creature, but it is also violent, selfish, lustful, and undisciplined. So, we must walk a knife edge between suppressing the factors that lead to disobedience and destroying that prized capacity for applying intelligence and aggression. Holly K, Senior Research Geneticist of Camino. Niner was hauling in his canopy when the explosion jerked him upright. A column of white rolling fire shot into the night sky above the tops of the trees. He knew it was hot and bright because his helmet visor's filter kicked in to stop it from overwhelming his night vision. Even though he knew it was coming, his heart sank. Darman probably hadn't made it. He disobeyed his order. He hadn't jumped when he told him to. So maybe you've lost a brother. Maybe not. Either way, you'll lose two more if you don't get your act together fast. Niner triangulated the position of the blast, and then went on bundling up the freefall canopy, cutting away the lengths of cord before burying it. With a breaking strength of 500 kilos, the cord was bound to come in handy. He wound each length in a figure eight around his thumb and smallest finger, and slipped the skeins into a belt pouch, then went in search of his extra pack. It hadn't fallen far from him. The low opening technique worked well if you needed accuracy. Niner found the pack at the edge of a field, covered in small, dark-furred animals that seemed fascinated by it and were gnawing at the soft padding strip on one side. He flashed his spot lamp to scatter them, but they stared back up at the beam, burst into angry chatter, and then turned toward him. It was unnerving. Nothing more. Their little teeth snapped impotently on his armor. He stood still assessing them, his databank scrolling in front of his eyes and telling him that they were Gadans, and that they weren't logged as a hostile alien species. All the non-human life Niner had ever seen for real other than Kaminoans and various instructors, had been on Geonosis and through a blaster site. He was utterly dependent on the intelligence loaded into his database. That, or finding things out for himself. All but one of the Gadans gave him up as inedible within a minute, and disappeared into the waist-high crop. The remaining creature worried away at his left boot, a tribute to its tenacity, if not its intelligence. Those boots were specced to withstand every assault, from hard vacuum to acid and molten metal. The little animal clearly believed in aiming high. Darman would have found it fascinating, he was sure. It was a pity to lose him. He had all the makings of a good comrade. Come on, Niner said, nudging the animal with the butt of his blaster rifle. I've got to get to work. Shove off. The Gadan, teeth locked around a clamp, looked up and met his eyes. Or at least, 
It seemed like it. It could only have really seen a faint blue light. Then it let go and trotted back toward the field, pausing once to stare back at him before disappearing into a hole in the ground with all the ease of a diver. Niner took out his data pad and calculated his position. There was no GPS he could lock into without the Nemoidians detecting him, but he could at least use dead reckoning based on the sprayer's last position, matching features on the landscape to his chart. It was old-fashioned soldiering. He liked it. He had to be able to do the business when the tech wasn't there, even if that meant using nothing but a Trandoshan blade. If you stab someone in the heart, they can still run. I once saw a man run a hundred meters like that, screaming as well. Go for the neck, like this. Sergeant Skirata had taught them a lot about knives. Put a bit of weight behind it, son. Still, tech had its place. A speeder bike would have been handy, although they hadn't thought they needed them. The insert was supposed to be five clicks from the target. Never mind, he thought. It would make me look pretty conspicuous out here anyway. The gear would slow him on his way to the pre-agreed rendezvous point, but he'd get there. If Phi and Atten had landed safely, they'd be heading for RV Alpha too. He started tabbing, trying to make ten clicks an hour, avoiding tracks and open ground. In the end, he had to drag the extra pack behind him on straps like a sled. Tactical advance into battle, tabbing, as Skarata called it, meant walking at six to ten clicks an hour for a twenty-five kilo pack. But that's for ordinary men the instructor would say, as if non-clones were subhuman. You will do better, because you are better. Niner was lugging nearly three times that load now. He didn't feel better at all right then. He decided to add a portable repulsor lift to his new list of gear to request upon return. Kilora's moon was in its new phase, and he was grateful for that. In his light gray armor, he would have stood out like a beacon. Hadn't the top brass thought of that either? He stifled the uncharacteristically critical opinion about his superiors, and decided there had to be something that he didn't know, but they did. He had his orders. Even so, he diverted to a narrow river shown on the hollow chart, and stopped long enough to smear mud all over his armor and gear. There was no point chancing his luck. At 400 meters from RV Point Alpha, he slowed down, and not because he was struggling under the weight. A silent approach was necessary. He hid the pack that he was dragging deep in the undergrowth, and recorded its location to collect later. Fionatin might have been tracked. They might not have made it at all. There was always the possibility of ambush. No, he definitely wasn't taking chances. For the last 200 meters, he got down in the grass and crawled. But they were there, and alone. Niner found himself staring up into the beam from Phi's helmet, and he knew that the infrared targeting was centered at the point between his filtration mask and the top of his chest plate. It was a vulnerable point, provided one got close enough and used the right caliber rounds. Not many hostiles could get that close, of course. You gave me a start, Sarge, Phi said holding his blaster clear and looking him over. He killed the light and indicated his chest plate. Great minds, eh? Phi's armor was no longer pristine either. Niner wasn't sure what he'd smeared over it, but it disrupted his outline well enough. The thought had obviously occurred to all of them. Atten was daubed with something dark and matte as well. Shape, shine, shadow, silhouette, smell, sound, and movement, Niner said, repeating the rules of basic camouflage. If it hadn't been for Darman's absence, he would have found the situation funny. He tried. Shame they couldn't find something beginning with S to complete the set. I could, Atten said. Any contact from Darman? They were forty kilometers from the point where Niner had landed. I saw the blast. He was last off. You saw him jump then? No. He was grabbing as much gear and ordnance as he could salvage. Niner felt he needed to explain. He shoved me out the hatch first. I shouldn't have let that happen. But I didn't abandon him. Atten shrugged. So what have we got then? We've got a brother missing. I meant by way of resources. He had most of the demolition ordinance. I know you meant that, and I don't want to hear it. If he could feel concern, even sorrow, for Darman, then why couldn't Atten? But it was no time to start a fight. They had to stick together now. A four-man mission with three men? Their chances of succeeding had plummeted already. We're a squad now. Get used to it. Fi interrupted. He seemed to have a knack for diffusing situations. All our gear's intact anyway. We can still put quite a dent in them if we have to. And what did they have to put a dent in exactly? They had high-altitude drone reccees of the target building, but no idea yet if the walls were just plastered rocks, or if they were lined with shock-absorbing alloy plates. There could be just the 30 or so guards seen walking the perimeter, or hundreds more holed up in underground barracks. Without better intelligence, they had no way of knowing just how much gear was enough for the job. 
It was a case of adding P for plenty, just to be sure. Niner liked to be sure. How much time are we going to spend looking for him? Atten asked. They know they've got company now. It wasn't exactly a silent insert. SOPs, Niner said. Standard operating procedures. That was how things should be done, how commandos expected them to be done. We get to each RV point for the time we agreed upon, and if he doesn't show, we'll go to the position of the blast and see what's left. Then we'll decide if we're going to consider him MIA or not. You'd want us to search if it was you missing, Feist said to Adden. He can't call in, not at any range. Too risky. I wouldn't expect you to compromise the mission for me, Atten said, distinctly acid. Just shut it, will you? Niner said. The good thing about ultra-short-range comlinks was that you could stand around and have a blazing argument inside those helmets, and nobody outside could hear you. Finding him isn't only the right thing to do, it's the sensible thing to do. Locate him, and we find his gear. Okay? Yes, Sarge, Fy said. Got it, Atten said. But there has to be a point where we consider him dead. Without a body, that'll be when Geonosis freezes over, Niner said, still angry and not knowing why. Until then, we're going to sweat our guts out to find him, provided it doesn't blow the mission. Now let's see if we can sling this gear between some poles or something. We'll never keep this pace up for tens of kilometers unless we find a better way of transporting it. Niner set his helmet comm link to receive long range anyway. If Darman was out there, Niner wasn't planning on abandoning him. The clearing hadn't been there yesterday. Itain picked her way through flattened Kuvara saplings and into a circle of blackened stubble, following Burhan's steps. The air smelled of smoke and roasted bark. He was swearing fluently. She didn't know much Kilurin, but she knew a curse when she heard one. This is your lot again, Burhan said. He surveyed the field, hands on his brow, to block out the sun breaking over the horizon. Now that it was daylight, they could see the extent of the damage from last night's explosion. What am I going to do? What's going to happen to our contract? It wasn't phrased like a question. The Nemoidians weren't known to be sympathetic about the host of natural disasters constantly threatening the farming community's precarious existence. But this was no natural disaster. The blast area spanned around 500 meters, and the crater at the center was 12, maybe 15 meters wide. Itain didn't know how deep it was, but a Trandosian and a UBs were standing at the edge of it, peering down, blasters in hand, looking as if they were searching in the soil. They didn't take the slightest notice of her or Burhan. She must have looked suitably starved and dowdy, rough enough to pass for a farm girl. It was probably too late to convince them the crater was caused by a meteor fragment, but at this point, Itain didn't know any more than they did. Why do you think it's my lot? She asked. Obvious, Burhan said sourly. I've seen loads of speeders and freighters and sprayers come down hard. They don't leave craters. They falls apart and burns, yes, but they don't blow up half the countryside. This is off-planet. It's soldiers. He kicked around some of the charred and blackened stalks. Can't you have your fight on someone else's planet? Don't you think I got enough problems? She wondered for a moment if he was considering turning her into Hokan's men for a few credits to make up for the loss of the precious bark. She was already an extra mouth to feed at a time when money he was counting on had just gone up in a fireball with much of his crop. It was time to find somewhere else to hide, and some other plan for getting that information off Kilora. Itain was still considering the scorched land when the Ubees and the Trandosian jerked up right and turned to jog away toward the dirt track beside the field. The Ubees had one hand pressed on the side of his helmet, as if he was listening to something. A comlink, probably. Whatever the summons had been, it had been urgent enough to get them running. It also confirmed that this wasn't just a Narsh sprayer making an all-too-frequent crash landing. Itain waited a moment longer, then walked forward to peer into the pit to see what had engrossed them. It had been a monstrous blast. The sides of the blackened crater had been blown almost smooth, and there was debris everywhere. It was an enormous blast area for a small craft. She left Burhan and walked around inspecting the ground, as Hokan's men had done, not sure what she was seeking. She was almost at the Kuvara orchard before she saw it. The early sunlight caught a scrap metal edge of something embedded in the ground, rammed deep by the explosion. Itain crouched down, as casually as she could, and worked the soil loose from it with her fingers. It took her a few minutes to expose enough to understand the shape and a few more to work out why the scorched colors were so familiar. It was distorted, the metal frozen in a moment of being torn apart by enormous force. But she was pretty sure she'd seen one intact before. It was a plate from an R5 astromech droid. A plate with Republic markings. They're coming. Whoever they were, she hoped they'd made it alive. Darman knew it was risky moving around by day, 
and the fact that his right leg seemed to scream every time he put his weight on it didn't help matters. He'd spent two painful hours scooping out a shallow depression in a thicket about a hundred meters from what passed for a road. Roots and stones had slowed him down. So had the pounding he'd taken hitting the canopies of trees during his landing. But he dug in now, and he lay on the lattice of branches and leaves on his belly, watching the road, sometimes through his rifle sight, sometimes with the electro-binocular panel that flipped down in his visor. At least the little animals that had swarmed him in the night had disappeared. He'd given up trying to fend them off. They had explored his armor for a while, then moved on to watch him from distance. Now that it was daylight, there were no more glittering eyes staring out from the undergrowth. He still wasn't sure of his position either. There was no GPS network he could use without being picked up. He needed to get out and about to do a recce if he was going to have any chance of aligning the landscape features with the hollow chart. He knew he was facing north. The arc of small stones around a thin branch he'd stuck in the soil charted the sun's progress, and gave him his east-west line. If his data pad had calculated speed and distance correctly, he was between 40 and 50 clicks northeast of the first RV point. He'd never cover that distance on foot in time. Not with the extra gear, and not with his leg in this state. If he dragged the pack, he'd draw a neat follow-me line through the vegetation. Darwin eased himself over on his back, removed his leg plates, and unsealed his undersuit at the knee. It felt as if he'd torn a muscle or a tendon above the joint. He soaked the makeshift bandage with Bacta again and replaced the legging and plates before rolling back into position. It was high time he ate something, but he decided that he could wait a little longer. He checked the dirt road through the crosswires of the DC-17's electromagnetic scope. The first time he had worn the helmet with the built-in display shimmering before his eyes, he had been overwhelmed and disoriented by the flurry of symbols in his field of vision. The rifle scope made it seem even more chaotic. Lights, lights, lights. It was like looking from the windows of Topoka City at night, with the lamps and reflective surfaces of the refectory behind you. So many competing images that you couldn't focus on what lay beyond the stormproof glass. But in time, that time being the short, desperate morning when the whole of Kilo and Delta squads first wore the HUD display while using live ordnance, he got used to it. Those who didn't get used to it fast didn't return from the exercise. He learned to see, and yet not see. He was constantly aware of all of the status displays that told him when his weapons were charging, and if his suit was compromised, and what was happening around him. Now he was focused solely on looking down a clear tunnel, framed by interlocking segments of soothing blue, with a highlighted area to show when he had an optimum firing solution for his target. The information on range, environment, and the score of other options was still there. He could take them in without consciously seeing them. He saw only his target. A faint rubbing sound made him stiffen. Voices. They were approaching from his right. Then they stopped. He waited. Eventually the voices started again, and two weak ways came into his field of view, too slowly for his liking. They were looking at the road's shoulders with unusual diligence. One stopped suddenly and peered at the ground, apparently excited, if his arm gestures were any indication. Then he looked up, and started walking almost directly towards Darman's position. He took out a blaster pistol. He can't possibly see me, Darman thought. I've done this by the book. No reflection, no movement, no smells, nothing. But the weak way kept coming, right into the bushes. He stopped about ten meters from Darman, and was casting around as if he'd followed something and lost the trail. Then he moved forward again. Darman had almost stopped breathing. His helmet masked all sound, but it certainly didn't feel that way. The weak way was so close now that Darman could smell his distinctive sweat and see the detailed tooling on his sidearm. A KYD-21 with a hadrium barrel. And that there was a vibroblade in his other hand. Right at that moment, Darman couldn't even swallow. It's okay to be scared. The weak way stepped sideways, looking at waist height, as if browsing for discs on a library shelf. It's okay to be scared, as long as you... The weak way was right on him now, squatting over his position. Darman felt boots to press branches that were touching his back. And then the creature looked down and said something that sounded like, Gah. As long as you use it. Darman brought his fist up hard under the weak way's jaw, ramming his own vibroblade up into the throat and twisting his fist off to one side to sever blood vessels. He supported the dead weight of the impaled weak way on one arm until it stopped moving. Then Darman lowered his arm, shaking with the effort, and let the body roll onto the ground as quietly as he could. What you find? the other weak way yelled. Gayul? Ga? No answer. Well, here we go. Darman aimed his DC-17 and waited. The second weak way began running in a straight line towards the bushes, and that was a stupid thing for him to do when he had no idea what had happened to his comrade. They'd been lording it over farmers for too long. They were sloppy. 
he also made the mistake of pulling out his blaster. Darman had a clear headshot, and he took it almost without thinking. The weak way dropped cleanly and silently, and lay crumpled, with wisps of smoke rising from his head. Oh, clever, Darman sighed, as much to hear the reassurance of his own voice as anything. Now he'd have to break cover and retrieve the body. He couldn't leave it like a calling card. He waited a few minutes, listening, and then eased himself onto his injured leg to limp out into open ground. He dragged the weak way into the bushes, noting the smell of cooked meat. Now he could see what the first weak way had been following, a broad path of tiny animal footprints. The curious Gadans had given him away. He limped out again, checking carefully, and obliterated the drag marks with a branch. Waste not, want not. The weak ways wouldn't be needing the blasters or vibroblades now. Darman, pulse slowing to normal, searched the bodies for anything else of use, pocketing data cards and valuables. He didn't feel that he was a thief. He had no personal possessions that weren't the Grand Army's property, and he felt no need to acquire any, but there was a chance the cards contained information that would help him achieve his objective, and the beads and coins would come in handy if he needed to buy or bribe something, or someone. He found a suitable spot to hide the bodies. He didn't have time to bury them, but was suddenly aware of movement in the undergrowth, animal movement, and gradually small heads appeared, sniffing the air. You again, eh? Darman said, although the Gadans couldn't possibly hear him beyond the helmet. Way past your bedtime. They edged forward, and then swarmed across the weak way with the shattered skull, taking tiny bites as they settled on him in a dark furred blanket of snapping motion. Darman wouldn't have to worry about burying anyone. The faintest of liquid sounds made him look around at the other weak way. Darman had his rifle aimed instantly. The weak way wasn't dead, not quite. For some reason, that upset Darman more than he could have ever imagined. He'd killed plenty of times at Geonosis, smashing droids with grenade launchers and cannons at a distance, hyped up on fear and the instinct to live. Survive to fight. But this was different. It wasn't distance. And the debris of the kill wasn't metal. The weak way's blood had dried in a stream down his glove and right forearm plate, and he hadn't managed a clean kill. It was... wrong. They had drilled him to kill, and kill, and kill, but nobody had thought to teach him what he was supposed to feel afterward. He did feel something, and he wasn't certain what it was. He'd think about it later. Aiming his rifle, he corrected his mistake before the small army of carnivores could move on to their next meal. Chapter, Chapter 5 Think, think of yourselves yourself as a hand. hand. Each of you is a finger. finger. And without the others, you're useless. Alone, a finger can't grasp, or control, or form a fist. You are nothing on your own, and everything together. Commando Instructor, Sergeant Cal Scarada. Darman moved on fast, up a tree-covered slope a kilometer south. He planned on spending the rest of the daylight hours in a carefully constructed hide at the highest vantage point he could find, slightly below the skyline. He concentrated on making a crude net out of the canopy cords that he had salvaged. The activity kept him occupied and alert. He hadn't slept in nearly 40 standard hours. Fatigue made you more careless and dangerously unfocused than alcohol. When he had finished tying the cord into squares, he wove grass, leaves, and twigs into knots. On inspection, he decided it was a pretty good camouflage net. He also continued observation. Kidlura was astonishing. It was alive and different, a riot of scent and color and texture and sounds. Now that his initial pounding fear had subsided into general edginess, he began to take it all in. It was the little living noises that concerned him most. Around him, creatures crawled, flew, and buzzed. Occasionally, things squealed and fell silent. Twice now, he'd heard something larger prowling in the bushes. Apart from the brief intensity of Geonosis, Darman's only environmental experience had been the elegant but enclosed stilt cities of Camino, and the endless churning seas around them. The cleanly efficient classrooms and barracks where he had spent ten years turning from instant child to perfect soldier were unremarkable, designed to get a job done. His training in desert and mountain and jungle had been entirely artificial, hollow projection, simulation. The red desert plains of Geonosis had been far more arid and starkly magnificent than his instructor's imaginations. And now, Kilura's fields and woods held so much more than three-dimensional charts could offer. It was still open country, though a terrain that made it hard for him to move around unnoticed. Concentrate, he told himself. Gather intel. Make the most of your enforced idleness. Lunch would have been welcome about now. A decent lunch. He chewed on a concentrated dry ration cube and reminded himself that his constant hunger wasn't real. He was just tired. He had consumed the correct amount of nutrients for his needs, and if he gave in to eating more, he would run out of supplies. 
There was exactly enough for a week's operations in his pack, and two days' worth in his emergency belt. The belt was the only thing he would grab, apart from his rifle, if he ever had to make a last-ditch run for it without his 40-kilo pack. Beneath him, farm transports passed along a narrow track, all heading in the same direction, carrying square tanks with security seals on the hatches. Fuck. Darman had never tasted it, but he could smell it even from here. The nauseatingly musky, almost fungal scent took the edge off his appetite for a while. If he had his hollow charter lined correctly, the transports were all heading for a regional depot at Teclit. He twisted the image this way and that in his hands, and held it up to map onto the actual landscape. Yes, he was sure enough now where he was. He was ten clicks east of a small town called Imbrani. About forty clicks northeast of RV Point Beta, and forty clicks almost due east of RV Point Gamma. They picked RV points along the flight path, because the Separatists would expect dispersal, not a retracing of their steps. Between RVs Alpha and Beta was a stretch of woodland, ideal for moving undetected by day. If the rest of his squad had landed safely and were on schedule, they would be making their way to Beta. Things could be looking up again. All he had to do was get to RV Gamma, and wait for his squad. And if they hadn't made it, then he'd need to rethink the mission. And if they hadn't made it, then he'd need to rethink the mission. The idea produced a feeling of desolation. You are nothing on your own, and everything together. He'd been raised to think, function, and even breathe, as one of a group of four. He could do nothing else. But arcs always operate alone, don't they? He pondered that, fighting off drowsiness. Leaves rustled suddenly behind him, and he turned to scan with the infrared filter of his visor. He caught a blur of moving animal. It fled. His database said there were no large predators on Kilora. So whatever it was could be no more troublesome than the Gadans. Not as long as he was wearing his armor, anyway. Darman waited motionless for a few moments, but the animal was gone. He turned back and refocused on the road and surrounding fields, struggling to stay awake. Lay off the stims. No, he wasn't going to touch his med pack for a quick boost. Not yet. He'd save his limited supply for later, for when things got really tough, as he knew they would. Then, something changed in his field of vision. The frozen tableau had come to life. He flipped down the binoc filter for a closer look, and what he saw made him snap it back and gaze through the sniper scope of his rifle. A thin wisp of smoke rose from a group of wooden buildings. It was quickly becoming a pall. It wasn't the smoke of domestic fires. He could see flames, flaring tongues of yellow and red. The structures, barns judging by their construction. A group of people in drab clothing were scrambling around, trying to drag objects clear of the flames, uncoordinated, panicked. Another group, UBs, Trandosian, mainly Weakway, was stopping them, standing in a line around the barn. One of the farmers broke the line and disappeared into a building. He didn't come out again, not as long as Darman watched. Nothing in his training corresponded to what he was witnessing. There was not a memory, a pattern, a maneuver, or a lesson that flashed in his mind and told him how this should be played out. Civilian situations were outside his experience. Nor were these citizens of the Republic. They weren't anyone's citizens. His training taught him not to be distracted by outside issues, however compelling. But there was still some urge in him that said, do something. What? His mission, his reason for staying alive, was to rejoin his squad and thwart the nanovirus project. Breaking cover to eight civilians cut across all of that. The Separatists, or whoever controlled this band of assorted thugs, knew he was here. It didn't take a genius to work it out. The sprayer had exploded on landing, detonating any demolition ordinance that Darman hadn't been able to cram into his packs. The weakway patrol hadn't called in when their masters had expected. Now the humans, farmers, were being punished and threatened, and it was all to do with him. The Separatists were looking for him. Escape and evasion procedure. No, not yet. Darman inhaled and leveled his rifle carefully, picking out a UBs in the crosswires. Then he lined up the rest of the group one at a time. Eight hostiles, forty rounds. He knew he could slot every one first time. He held his breath, forefinger resting on the trigger. Just a touch. How many more targets were there that he couldn't see? He'd give away his position. This isn't your business. He exhaled and relaxed his grip on the rifle, sliding his forefinger in front of the trigger guard. What would happen to his mission if they caught him? In the next two minutes, reluctant to move, he targeted each UB's, Weakway, and Trandosian several times, but didn't squeeze the trigger. He wanted to, more than he could have imagined. It wasn't the hard-drilled, trained response of a sniper, but a helpless, impotent anger, whose origin he couldn't begin to identify. Don't reveal your position. 
Don't fire unless you can take out the target. Keep firing until the target is down and stays down. And then there were times when a soldier just had to take a chance. They could be Republic citizens one day. They could be allies now. Dharma wasn't tired anymore, or even hungry. His pulse was pounding loud in his ears, and he could feel the constriction in his throat muscles. The fundamental human reflex to flee or fight. Fleeing wasn't an option. He could only fight. He targeted the first weak way, a clean headshot, and squeezed the trigger. The creature dropped, and for a moment, his comrades stared at the body, unsure of what had happened. Darman had nothing against weak ways. It was only coincidence that this was the third one he'd killed in a few hours. And suddenly, unfrozen, the band of thugs all turned to stare in the direction of the shot, drawing their weapons. The first bolt hit the bush to Darman's left. The second went three meters over his head. They'd worked out where he was all right. Darman snapped on the DC-17's grenade attachment and watched through the scope as the civilians scattered. The grenade sent a shower of soil and shattered wood into the air, along with four of the eight militia. He'd certainly pinpointed his position now. When he sprang to his feet and began the run down the slope, the four remaining enemies stood and stared for a couple of seconds. He had no idea why, but they were transfixed long enough for him to gain the advantage. A couple of plasma bolts hit him, but his armor simply took it like a punch in the chest. And he ran on, laying down a hail of particle rounds. The bolts came toward him like horizontal luminous rain. One Trandosian turned and ran. Darman took him down with a bolt in the back that blew him a few meters farther as he fell. Then the white-hot rain stopped, and he was running over bodies. Darman slowed and pulled up, suddenly deafened by the sound of his own panting breath. Maybe they'd managed to report his presence via their comm links in time, and maybe they hadn't. The information wouldn't have been much use on its own anyway. He ran from barn to barn, checking for more hostiles. Walking through the flames unscathed, because his armor and bodysuit could easily withstand the heat of a wood fire. Even with the visor, he couldn't see much through the thick smoke, and he moved quickly outside again. He glanced at his arm. Smoke curled off the soot-blackened plates. Then he almost walked straight into a youth in a farmer's smock, staring at him. The boy bolted. Darman couldn't find any more of Hokan's troops. He came to the last barn and booted the door open. His spot lamp illuminated the dim interior and picked out four terrified human faces. Two men, a woman, and the boy he'd just seen, huddling in a corner next to a threshing machine. His automatic response was to train his rifle on them until he was sure they weren't hostiles. Not every soldier wears a uniform. But his instinct said they were just terrified civilians. He was still trailing smoke from his armor. He realized how frightening he looked. A thin, wavering wail began. He thought it was the woman, but it seemed to be coming from one of the men. A man just as old as Sergeant Scarada, who was staring at him in horror. I'm not going to hurt you, he said. Is this your farm? Silence, except for that noise the man was making. He couldn't understand it. He'd rescued them from the attackers, hadn't he? What was there to fear? How many troops has Hokon got? Can you tell me? The woman found her voice, but it was shaky. W what are you? I'm a soldier of the Republic. I need information, ma'am. You're not him? Who? Hokan. No. Do you know where he is? She pointed south, in the direction of Embrani. They're down at the farm the Kermay clan used to own before Hokan sold them to the Trandosians. About fifty, maybe sixty of them. What are you going to do to us? Nothing, ma'am. Nothing at all. It didn't seem to be the answer they were expecting. The woman didn't move. He brought them here looking for him said the man who wasn't whining, pointing at Darman. We've got nothing to thank him for. Tell him to... Shut up, the woman said, glaring at the man. She turned back to Darman. We won't say a word. We won't say we saw you. Just go. Get out. We don't want your help. Darman was totally unprepared for the reaction. He'd been taught many things, but none of his accelerated learning had mentioned anything about ungrateful civilians. Rescues thereof. He backed away and checked outside the barn door, before darting from barn to bush to fence, and up the slope to where he'd left his gear. It was time to move on. He was leaving a trail behind him now, a trail of engagements and bodies. He wondered if he'd see civvies, as Skarada called them, in quite the same benign way in the future. He checked the chrono readout in his visor. It had been only minutes since he had run down the slope, firing. It always felt like hours. Hours when he couldn't see anything but the target in front of him. Don't worry. Skarada had said. 
It's your forebrain shutting down. Just a fear reflex. You're bred from sociopathic stuff. You'll fight just fine. You'll carry on fighting when normal men have turned into basket cases. Darman was never sure if that was good or not, but it was what he was, and he was fine with that. He loaded his extra pack on his back and began working his way to the RV point. Maybe he shouldn't have expended so many rounds. Maybe he should have just left the farmers to their fate. He'd never know. Then it struck him why both the militia and the civilians had frozen when they first spotted him. The helmet. The armor. He looked like a Mandalorian warrior. Everyone must have been terrified of Gez Hokan. The similarity would either work to his advantage or get him killed. Down! Atten said. Niner flung himself flat and heard Fi grunt as he did the same. The air knocked from his lungs. An airspeeder flew overhead with a deceptively gentle hum. Atten, squatting in the cover of a fallen tree, followed it with his rifle scope. Two up. Camo and custom armament, he said. Somehow, I don't think the locals drive those. Not with mounted cannons, anyway. The hum of engines faded. Niner struggled to his feet and regained his balance, wishing for the speeder bikes and an absence of armor. The squad was too heavily laden, and the armor wasn't designed for blending into the landscape, although it was the difference between life and death in hostile territory. Protection against blaster fire, nerve agents, and even hard vacuum, and when they got to their target, it would come into its own. The armor was designed for Fibua ops, fighting in built-up areas and inside buildings. Urban warfare of the kind, the galaxy now had plenty to offer. For now, they just have to make the best of the scenic part of the mission. He was tired. They all were. Not even the animal panic brought on by the risk of discovery could shake that off. They needed sleep. Niner checked his data pad. They were still ten clicks from RV Beta, and it was midday. It was much easier to move by night, so he wanted to press on to make the RV point by mid-afternoon. Then lie up until nightfall. If Darman had made it, and maybe he hadn't, but Niner's mind was made up. They would wait for him. The quiet drone of engines interrupted Niner's calculations. The airspeeder was heading south, toward them again. They froze, mud smeared, invisible from that altitude. Or so they hoped. It wasn't entirely training that produced the reaction. Aerial surveillance was especially threatening. Niner recalled the Kaminoan KE-8 enforcer craft cruising above the training grounds of Topoka City, ready to pluck out and discipline any defective clone who didn't conform. They were equipped with electroshock devices. He'd seen a KE-8 in action just once. After that, he worked extra hard to conform. He's on a square search, Atten said. He was turning into an excellent point man. For some reason, he was slightly more attuned to his surroundings than Phi or even Niner himself. He must be working out from the center. Center of what, though? Phi asked. Niner forgot his fatigue. You never leave your mates behind. If he hasn't seen us, he's seen Darman. Or what's left of him. Shut it, Atten. What's your problem? I've been Darman, Atten said. He said nothing more. Niner didn't think it was a good time to ask for an explanation. The engines were overhead. Then the sound faded a little and dropped in pitch, but soon resumed full volume. He's circling, Atten said. Fire feck, Niner said, and all three men reached for their anti-armor grenade attachments at the same time. What's he seen? Maybe nothing, Fi said. Maybe us. They fell silent. The airspeeder was indeed circling. It had also dropped lower, and was now about level with the tops of the trees. Niner could see its twin cannons. His helmet wasn't telling him it had locked on, but that didn't mean it hadn't. You could never count on tech. Best, Best piece, piece of gear, of gear is, the is the eyeball. eyeball. It was the first piece of advice Garada had ever given him. Accelerated learning was fine, but anything direct from the mouths of men who had fought real engagements left a bigger impression. Niner leveled his rifle and peered through the scope, trusting to blast tech industries that the sight really wasn't reflective. He'd find out the hard way if it was. He could see the sun glinting off a human pilot's goggles. The gunner was a droid. He wondered if they felt vulnerable without any armored canopy. Heads conveniently skylined for a shot. He suspected anyone looking down from that height with a cannon or two didn't feel vulnerable at all. The fuselage banked above him and turned slowly, rising well above the trees as if the pilot was trying to get a visual fix again. It wasn't coincidence. Niner kept the DC-17 trained on the central propulsion unit. Then a red flashing symbol went off in his visor. The thing had a lock on him. He squeezed the trigger. The white-hot blast kicked his visor into blackness for an instant, and the detonation was so close that the shockwave hit him like a body blow. He scrambled to his feet and ran. 
How he ran with more than 50 kilos of dead weight on his back, he would never know, but adrenaline could do remarkable things. His instinct was to get clear before debris rained down on him. Armor and bodysuits could withstand a lot, but the human instinct buried deep inside him screamed, Get clear. When he stopped, he had covered a hundred meters, even in the tangled undergrowth of the coppice. He was panting like a mott, and the suit was struggling to cool him down. Behind him, a fire burned, with smaller flames scattered around it like ceilings around a tree. He turned to look at Phi and Atten. His first thought was that he had brought the speeder crashing down on them. Did you have to? Phi was right next to him. He hadn't heard him above the noise of his own breathing. He got a lock on me, Niner said, feeling relieved, and then oddly guilty, but not sure why. I know. I saw your DC go up, and I thought I'd better get moving, or I'd be wearing a speedy. Atten? Can't hear him. That didn't mean anything. The close-range comm setting was only ten meters. Atten could be anywhere. Nenner didn't know him well enough to guess his movements, and it had been enough of a close shave for him to not spend much time contemplating the issue. Now, he was worried that he, the sergeant, the man they looked to for leadership, had run for it without thinking of them, and that they knew that. This is going to make a nice marker, Fi said, staring up at the climbing smoke. It would be visible for a long, long way. What did you expect me to do? Lie there and take a cannon round? No, Sarge. I thought you'd managed to double tap, though. He laughed. Better make sure nobody survived. It was a remote chance, but speeders could be surprisingly robust. Niner and Fi walked back through the smoke, rifles ready. Droid parts were scattered across the scene of devastation. One scuttle-shaped faceplate, staring up at the pall of smoke, as if in surprise. They don't bounce much, then, Fi said, and moved it with his boot. Atten, Fi here. You there? Over? Silence. Fi put his left gauntlet against his ear. Niner wondered if he'd now lost two men in as many days. Atten here. Over. Atten stepped out of the smoke, dragging his extra pack and a scorched hunk of metal that trailed a few wires and plugs. The pilot didn't bounce either he said. Here, help me get this strapped on again. It took both Fi and Niner to lift the pack and reattach it to his armor. A few days earlier, either one of them could have managed it single-handed. We're too exhausted to be safe, Niner thought. Time to get out of here and get some rest. I might be able to get something from this, Atten said, indicating the charred metal box in one hand. It was the first time Niner had heard him sound remotely cheerful, Atten seemed to relate to gear better than he did to people. Worth a try. Niner took over the point position, and they struggled into denser cover. He glanced back and hoped the flames would burn themselves out. They didn't have a hope of outrunning a full-scale forest fire, but maybe that was the least of their problems. And if Darman was alive and anywhere near, he'd see their handiwork, and Niner hoped he'd recognize it as such. The squad had now left a couple of telltale marks of combat on a sleepy rural landscape, whether it wanted it or not, Kilura was involved in the war. You're a decoot, Hokan said. He took off his helmet. His face was centimeters from the Ubizas, and he wanted it to look him in the eye. As a species, they weren't prone to trembling, but this one was doing a fine job of being an exception. What are you? He whispered. A, a decoot, sir. You've made me look like a decoot, too. I don't like that. Hokan had assembled his entire senior staff in the room. He reminded himself that the room was in fact a disused Merley shearing shed, and that his lieutenants were the twenty least stupid individuals selected from the criminal detritus that had washed down society's sewer to Kilura. It disappointed him that the Nemoinians would spend so much on secure communications and so little on personnel. A few credits more, and he could have bought the small army he needed. The UBs, Kalsh, was standing absolutely still in the middle of the room as Hokan circled. It might have been a female, because you could never tell with UBs, but Hokan suspected it was male. He hadn't wanted to hire UBs. They could be unpredictable, even sly. But very few mercenaries wanted to work on Kilora, and those who did were simply unemployable anywhere else. Almost always because of a criminal record even a hut would balk at. And here he was, paying them what he could because An Kit wouldn't fork out for proper support. Hokan despaired, and when he despaired of professional standards, he suspected extreme coaching was necessary to refocus the team. So you torched another farm, he said. It was a warning, sir. In case they got any ideas. You know, hiding people they shouldn't. 
No, that's not how it works. Hokan propped his backside against the edge of the table and stared into the anonymous masked face, arms folded. He didn't like people whose eyes he couldn't see. You warn them first. If they break the rules, then you punish them. If you punish them before they break the rules, then they have nothing to lose. And they hate you, and they will seek revenge. And so will their offspring. Yes, sir. Do you understand that? Hokan looked around at the assembled staff, and spread his arms in invitation to join the coaching session. Does everyone understand that? There were some grunts. Does everyone understand that? Hokan snarled. What do we say when an officer asks you a question? Yes, yes sir. sir! Good. Hokan said quietly. He stood up again, then he took out Foulier's lightsaber, activated the beam, and sliced it through the Ubiza's neck, sending the head flying. Bloodless, quiet, and clean. There was a sudden and absolute silence. The staff had been quiet before, but they'd been making the marginal noises of people forced to endure a boring lesson. Now there was not the slightest swallow, cough, or sigh. Nobody breathed. He peered down at the body, and then at the legs of his dark gray uniform trousers. Perfectly clean. No blood. He rather liked this lightsaber now. He sat back on the edge of the desk. That, Hokan said, was punishment for Kaelsh. It's a warning for the rest of you. Now is the difference clear. It's very important. Yes, yes sir. sir. Fewer voices joined in this time, and they wavered. Then go and find our visitors. And you, Mukit, clear up this mess. You're you bees. You understand the proper way to dispose of the remains. The group began filing out, and Mukit edged over to the neatly sundered body of Kalsh. Hokan caught the arm of his senior Weequay lieutenant as he tried to slip through the door. Gutene, where's your brother and his friend? He asked. They haven't shown up for two meals, and they haven't signed off shift. Don't know, sir. Are they making a few credits on the side with that Trandosian? A bit of freelance slaving? Sir, I need to know. To work out if anything unusual might have happened to them. Gutene, no doubt recalling what Hokan had done to him when he had chased that farm girl, moved his lips soundlessly. Then his voice managed to surface above his fear. I never seen, sir. Not at all. Not since yesterday. I swear. I chose you as my right hand, man, because you could very nearly express yourself in several syllables. Sir? That makes you an intellectual among your kind. Don't make me doubt my judgment. Not seen him, sir. Honest. Never. Then get out on the route they were patrolling and see what you can find. Hokan reached across his desk and took out the electroshocker. It was only an agricultural instrument for herding, but it worked fine on most non-animal species. Gudene eyed it cautiously. This is why I disapprove of undisciplined acts like thieving and drinking. When I need to be certain of someone's whereabouts, I can't be. When I need resources, they're already committed. When I need competence, my staff is... distracted. He pushed the shocker up into the Weequay's armpit. There is a Republic presence here. We don't know the size of the force, but we do have a speeder down and a large black crater at Imbrani. The more data I have, the more I can assess the size of the threat and deal with it. Understood? Yes, sir. Hokan lowered the shocker, and the Weequay shot out the door. His enthusiasm for his career refreshed. Hokan prided himself on motivational skills. It started, he thought. He shut himself in his room and switched on all the comlink screens. They're coming to take Kilura. Hokan had some idea of what kind of deal Ankit had with the Separatists. There had been a significant amount of construction work carried out to convert a grain store into the kind of building that had triple sealed doors and the type of walls that could be sterilized with extreme heat. Then he'd had to try to make credible bodyguards out of the rabble he employed because important separatist scientists came and went. And the Nemoidians saw conspiracy everywhere they looked. They weren't always wrong about that. Then the Jedi came to Umbrani, and it all fell into place, as neatly as the arrival of the Republic forces now on the planet. There was a military target here. 
I'm my father's son, though. I'm a warrior. Hokan wondered if all cultures separated from their heritage were unable to move on, doomed to relive old glories. I'd rather be fighting a worthy opponent than terrorizing farmers who haven't got the guts to stand up for themselves. Fighting soldiers also commanded a higher fee, of course. And the greater the fee, the quicker he would be off this planet and heading... somewhere. There was no longer a home for him, and few of his kind left. But things could change. Yes, they very well might one day. Hokan leaned back in the chair, and let the chatter of comlinks wash over him. And that is going to do it for us for part two of Star Wars Republic Commando Hard Contact. I want to say thank you guys all so much for listening, if you still are. If you guys liked this reading, then please make sure you like, subscribe, and make sure absolutely you comment below. And I will make sure to read the best comments in the next video. Once again, thank you guys so much for watching or listening or streaming or doing whatever it is you do with our videos. I appreciate it so much. You guys are awesome. And thank you for being members of the Fulcrum Knights. We could not do any of this without you guys. And of course, as I always say, we are all Fulcrum. Thanks, everybody. Take it easy.